Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, before we start with the session, can you please give me a confirmation if the audio and video are clear to you all? You can respond to me in the live chat. Once you give me a confirmation, I'll start with the session. Please give me a confirmation if the audio video is clear to you all. Okay. Thank you for the confirmation. Let us begin with the session for today. So today's session is the first part of the UPSC CPWD previous year questions of 2016 question paper. So this was the question paper for the requirement of the deputy and assistant architects during the year 2016. So this is a question paper. I hope you know the structure for the uh, CPWD question paper. It is a 120 question uh, set. It is a question paper with 120 questions. Each question has two and a half marks and there is negative marking for the incorrect questions or incorrect attempts. And the exam, uh, so the, the total, it's a two hour examination. So 120 questions we will be doing in a four part series. So today's part one, we'll try to handle with, uh, we'll discuss about 30 questions on each in each session. So this will be a one hour live session in which we will discuss the first 30 questions of the 2016 question paper of CPWD. So let me begin with the session. Uh, let us look into the questions one by one. So the first question, uh, so this is CPWD UPSC 2016. Anti-static tiles are usually specified in areas having. Uh, so the options given, let's go through the options, chemical spillage, high dampness, several electrical equipment, movement of heavy machinery. So if you know what is static charge, the word static, uh, static electricity, you might have heard about the term, just a second. Hmm. So, static electricity is something which is produced due to charged particles when there are two surfaces which come into continuous contact and they move away. You might have uh, studied about the experiment of using a comb on your head and putting onto pieces of paper. The pieces of paper get attracted towards the comb and that's because of the static charges. So whenever there is built up of charged particles on a flooring or any surface, the, uh, this becomes an issue. So you might have also experienced this in winters when you use blankets, there is some static charge which you feel. So whenever there are two surfaces which come into contact, there is built up of charged particles on both of the surfaces. Now, when we walk on the floor, when people walk on normal flooring, there is a built up of static electricity. There is a built up of charged particles on the surface. Now, the the charged particles is the the the, the charged particles built up. The electricity produced or say the current produced is not a major one. It is a very minor static current which generates over here. But it becomes an issue particularly in those areas where you have electrical equipment, particularly in data centers and all. It becomes important to dissipate these charged particles. If you let these charged particles to accumulate, it can cause damage of the electrical equipment. So, in the wherever there are several electrical equipment, there we need to provide stat anti-static tiles are basically designed to dissipate these charged particles mainly by using copper channels and uh, connecting it to the earth. So the earthing technique is used basically in these tiles. So the answer would be several electrical equipment even if you don't know what are anti-static tiles. You, uh, so this is prone to happen in the examination when you look into questions even if you don't know the concept directly try to analyze try to look into the words used in the question and try to understand the meaning. So anti-static tiles. So if you refer if you know what are static charged particles you will understand that it is important in electrical equipment room. So that's how you need to address the questions. Uh, so moving further the next second question the project habitat montreal canada designed by renault architect moshi safdi is an example of dash 
prefabricated housing, low-rise detached dwellings, high-rise apartments and organic architecture. When would you be able to answer such questions if you know architects and the famous buildings and most importantly when you know how to visualize, when you have looked into the pictures, when you visualize them that's when you will be able to answer the questions in a better manner. So the building Habitat 67 it's named as Habitat 67 because it was built to house the World Exposition of 1967 which was held in Montreal, Canada. So this particular structure was designed by Moshe Safdi. Now the interesting feature is Moshe Safdi actually designed this particular building or the, uh, the concept which is used in this building uh, was used or was developed by him during his architectural thesis. So later on he developed into this particular project and uh, uh, executed it on site in the year 19. So to house the world exposition of 1967. So that's the reason it's called as Habitat 67. If you look into the picture you can see uh, which one you think would be the appropriate answer. The most appropriate would be that it is a prefabricated structure, prefabricated housing because this particular structure was constructed using precast concrete blocks uh, of standard dimensions around 354 concrete precast concrete blocks were attached co concrete units were attached to build this structure so prefabricated housing is the correct answer what is prefabricated housing it's basically where the blocks or the components of the building are manufactured earlier and just assembled on the site so that's how this particular building was constructed it had 354 prefab blocks or units so that's the most appropriate answer over here uh, moving on to the next one the third question logical process and magical abstraction are two aspects of the options given are architectural design methodology structural analysis physical planning and urban design methodology i would strongly recommend you in these sessions in these live sessions of uh, solving the papers Whenever we, you're, you're watching, so I, I'm giving you time once I read the question. So try to write down the answer, you have a piece of paper, have a pen with you, write down the answer uh, on the piece of paper before we discuss. So, so that you know, to, to get a sense of how much you already know, what are the areas you need to work on. In the sessions, we will discuss the questions, the answers and the meaning with explanations. But try to answer, try to take an attempt that way you will boost, it will build up your confidence also during the course of the sessions. So logical process and magical abstract are two aspects of dash in this particular question uh, so it, there are two approaches in architectural design you might have studied so right away from your now for the cpwd examination only architects are eligible so you already must be registered with council of architecture so i'm sure you have studied your five years of architecture already now uh, in the first right away from the first year we learn how to design things we uh, also design abstract models we also present architectural drawings where buildings are derived from abstractness so there are two design processes which are generally used in architectural design methodology now why is this the answer let us try to get a brief idea on what are the two groups two types of architectural design when you design buildings number one could be a logical process so logical process is that part of architectural design which focuses more on functionality more, the focus is more towards functionality, the design of the building, the exterior of the building, the building envelope, the look and feel of it, everything relates to the functionality in logical approach, in logical process. So that's one process. The second way where you might have also heard, uh, looked into buildings, like for example, uh, if you look into the deconstructive building, the dancing house. It's where the, there is abstractness in it. There's, it's not necessarily functionality, but the building is designed to look as if two people are dancing together. Uh, so that is in, a, is in Prague, Zak Republic, Prague, right? So that's a very famous building. So that basically is an example for magical abstraction. Even uh, the Heather Ali Center in Baku designed by Zaha Adit. So that also has these flowing curves. So that's basically an abstract design. The shape, the form is not defined by any logic or functionality. It is derived from the abstractness and the perceivance uh, or the perception of what is aesthetically good. Uh, the perception of the architect, the perception of the designer. So that's basically magical abstraction. So magical abstraction is an approach in architectural design which relates to creativity, which focuses on creativity and perception. 
So these are the two approaches in architectural design. One is moving uh, or designing spaces based on functionality that's called as logical process. Magical abstraction is a process where the form and the design of the building is governed by creativity and perception of the architect who is designing the building. So that's the answer. So these are two approaches in architectural design methodology. So uh, the answer would be option A for this third question. Uh, so now we are taking time to discuss each and every question approximately two to two and a half minutes. But remember, it is very important to note that in the actual examination, it would be one minute per question on an average. It's a two hour examination and you will have 120 questions to answer. So you will not have a huge amount of time and you should not invest a lot of time on one question. If you are confused about something, you can mark that for review and move on towards the next question. You can come back to the questions which you are confused with later on because if you spend a lot of time on each question initially itself, you will uh, not be able to reach towards the end of the question paper, right? Uh, Yeah, Vishant, that's a good observation. You can save logical processes more towards uh, the form follows function. That's how you can say generally in modern architecture, that's what happens, right? So that's logical approach. Moving on to the fourth one, fourth question. Design of Jain temple complex at Ranakpur is an example of unilateral symmetry, asymmetry, bilateral symmetry and three-dimensional symmetry. Now, in order to answer this question, you should know what are the types of symmetry. There are mainly two types of symmetry in architecture in, architecture, in buildings. One is bilateral symmetry, the second is radial symmetry. For example, if you look into uh, the India gate or gateway of India, so it is basically where you can draw a line in the center. So if you are having a building or a structure, let us say gateway of India or India gate both, if you draw a line in the center, the left part is an exact mirror image or is exactly same of the right side part. If you are able to divide the buildings into two equal parts, not only in terms of elevation as such, if you cut it through the center, if you get two equal pieces, that's called as a bilateral symmetry in architecture. This is referred to as bila bilateral because you are getting two equal pieces. There are two, uh, so to have, there is nothing called as unilateral symmetry. Symmetry happens only when you are having two equal pieces, right? So bilateral symmetry is one type. That's the first type of symmetry. Second one is radial symmetry. Now, radial symmetry is where the organization of the overall space itself, it is in terms of a symmetrical composition. For example, Taj Mahal, you have a central chamber, you have four minars on all the four corners. So it is radially symmetrical. So that's called as a radial symmetry. Radial symmetry is where the components are not only in terms of elevation, in terms of uh, 3D, but in all the, so it is radial from the central point. That's called as a radial symmetry. Now, Taj Mahal is not only radial symmetry, it is bilateral symmetry as well. You can cut it into two equal halves. But it is also a radial symmetry uh, which you see in it because of the organization of the spaces. So, radial symmetry mainly will be about a central point, whereas bilateral symmetry will mainly be about a central plane. So, these are the two main types of symmetry. The other options given three-dimensional symmetry, both are 3D symmetry, bilateral and radial symmetry. So, there is nothing specifically as such three-dimensional, two-dimensional symmetry. You can say two-dimensional symmetry is symmetry of 2D objects. Three-dimensional symmetry is 3D of uh, is a symmetry of three-dimensional objects. However, it itself is not a type of symmetry. So, from the two types of symmetry which you see in architectural buildings, the Jain temple at Ranakpur, if you can see, you can divide it into two equal halves across this center. It is not necessarily a three because if you look into the plan of this particular building, it will it has a, a composition of various walled compartments. So it's not like all the spaces throughout it are not radially symmetrical. But uh, in terms of the elevation, you can clearly see that it is of bilateral symmetry. So the option, appropriate option here would be bilateral symmetry. So uh, when would you be able to answer such questions? If you have an understanding of how the building looks by reading the question, you should visualize the picture of it. So try to during this course of your preparation for CPWD examination, whichever building you're studying about, whichever architect you're studying about, try to focus on visual understanding, try to look at pictures and images that will be of importance to answer such questions in the mm -hmm. examination. Now moving on, uh, the fifth question. Lee Corbuzer put forward, put forth his theory of proportions in a book titled. So uh, this question is not only based, generally in competitive exams, you get questions where they give you name of a book and ask you who is the author of it. 
Now, this is a next level question. It's not only where you, they ask you the name of the author of a book. They're asking what is written in which book. So you should also have a brief idea. It's not just like, okay, image of the city is written by Kevin Lynch. I know that I'll just wait, stop over there. No, you should know what did Kevin Lynch propose in image of the city. So not only Kevin Lynch, all the important authors, important books, works in architecture and design. You should know the content also briefly. If you're not reading the book, it's not possible for us to read all the famous books before the examination but have a gist of everything that is important so the answer for this question I, I asked you to take a to write down your answers in a piece of paper in front of you I hope most of you have already done that so let me discuss the answer for this uh, the theory of proportions was particularly discussed by Lee Corbusier in the book of the modular I hope you know about the modular man so you can see this picture so this is a sketch provided by Lee Corbusier in the book the modular where he explained the concept of the modular man So it was basically a measurement proportioning system which was given by Le Corbusier. So the point is, the let me give you a bit of background why did uh, Le Corbusier propose this modular man in the book The Modular which relates to the theory of proportions. Uh, so basically Le Corbusier felt when architects design spaces, design interiors, design buildings, the windows, doors, everything is ultimately being used by human beings, by people. So the sizes of these should not be governed by a uh, metric system in it's not like okay the standard door should be one meter wide two meter height so that is standardizing in metric system not also in uh, fps in the feet system in uh, you should not have a standard like three and a half feet should be the width of the door eight feet should be the height of the door so that is standardizing in feet system so lee corbuzer felt that the dimension of spaces and interiors should not be standardized as per metric system or as per the feet system feet inches measurement system rather the proportion and the size of spaces should be governed by the human proportions because people are going to ultimately use it so that was the background where Lee Corbusier proposed the concept of modular man now you can also get questions in competitive exams like what are the inputs for the proportioning system the modular man modular man which was given by Le Corbusier there are two major inputs to it remember that is also important what are the two inputs for the proportioning of modular man number one is anthropometric proportioning scale anthropometry it's an anthropometric scale what is anthropometric scale a scale based on human measurements so you can see it is a scale based on human that's number one number two it is a scale which also takes inputs from golden proportion so he also took inputs from golden proportion to devise this modular man so by combining the golden proportion and also human proportions Lee Corbusier gave the concept of modular man which is a unifying measurement system which Lee Corbusier felt that architects should use in fact it would be interesting for you to know that Lee Corbusier did not only give this theory he also implemented in his projects one best example where he implemented this particular modular man proportioning system was United D habitation which is a set of so there are four three or four buildings which Lee Corbusier designed by the same name United D habitation which is a linear plan building elongated apartment building where the size of the doors windows the interiors the exterior everything was governed by the proportions of the modular man so uh, what is now modular man it is a proportioning system based on human proportions and golden ratio so what is the meaning of proportion you can see here if a person needs to sit on a piece of furniture at a lower level this should be the height I think it is written as 26 centimeters it is so the next proportion is 43 so basically each level of it is obtained by multiplying with it with a golden ratio golden ratio is 1.618 right so taking a number 27 multiplied with 1.618 you will get the next level that is 43 multiplied with 1.618 Round, rounding off to closest digit you will get the next level that is 70 now there are some uh, levels which come in between which might not fit in the series of golden proportion because uh, in the modular man concept Le Corbusier gave two series red series and blue series now I'm not going into the details of explaining you red series and blue series you can study from your end also so there are two types of red series and blue series so combining both these series both are based on golden proportion 
so he, Lee Corbuzier gave the proportions uh, what uh, what should be the height of various furniture equipment what should be the size of the door and window so uh, so all these are based on human proportions so all these the theory of proportioning systems in architecture was proposed in the book of the modular from the given options the dimensions the golden section is not name of any book written by Lee Corbuzier fourth option towards the new architecture is also a book written by Lee Corbuzier what is the major outcome of towards the new architecture I hope you all know in your course of BRC you might have studied about the five points on architecture five points of modern architecture is a theory given by Lee Corbuzier uh, in which I hope you know that free openness in plan free open facade terrace garden so five points were given uh, the ribbon windows and also the pilot is that's the first one actually the columns uh, using structural columns instead of load bearing walls so those five points of architecture proposed by Lee Corbuzier so if you do not know study about it it's an important theory and a concept related to architecture by Lee Corbuzier so five points of modern architecture this was proposed by Lee Corbuzier and written in this book towards the new architecture now just like I told you the concept of modular man was implemented in United Habitation similarly Lee Corbuzier implemented the five points of modern architecture in one of his books try to find out the name of that structure or building and you can comment it in the comment section of this video it would be a good exercise for you uh, so uh, towards a new architecture five points of modern architecture were implemented in which project by Lee Corbuzier by the end of this session if everyone if anyone comments it in the live chat I will confirm the answer otherwise we can confirm later or you can comment it in the comment section of this video I will let you know I'll respond at the first correct answer I will respond and confirm that it is correct right so do that research from your end moving on to the next sixth question let us look into the ne next one providing a protective cap or course providing a protective cap or course to an exterior wall is designated as so I hope you know in compound walls particularly or in parapet walls which are exposed to the atmospheric so to, to the climatic conditions of rainfall particularly someone I think commented the answer Villa Savai that's the correct answer that's the building where Lee Corbuzier implemented five points of architecture uh, I think Sapna Rajput that's the correct answer very good moving on so the protective cap of course on an exterior wall I was saying uh, pilaster gable coping template so uh, in compound walls or in parapet walls particularly a weathering surface is provided so a weathering in architecture is any sloping surface so generally a sloping surface is provided on the top of compound walls this element is called as coping so there are two terms here weathering and coping so the element on the top this is called as coping coping is an element which has a sloping surface the sloping surface of coping is called as weathering in architecture weathering is basically a sloping surface to drain the rain water so you can say one, what is an example of weathering if someone asks you you can say that uh, coping stone is an example uh, for the weathering uh, surface in architecture one more example for weathering would be sill in window sill also you provide a sloping surface so at the sill of a window that also can be called as a weathering surface so coping is the answer for this question uh, generally coping remember one more term related to this whenever you have a coping or weathering particularly you also provide a throating throating is a small groove which you provide at the under bottom surface even in window sills you provide it wherever there is weathering you provide a throating what is throating it is a groove which is provided to uh, avoid the rainwater from entering in so if rainwater is draining over here throating will basically help in dripping away the rainwater if you do not have throating the rainwater can enter and spoil the integrity structural integrity of the wall itself so these are some terms which you need to remember coping weathering and throating these are three terms which you have to remember with respect to the context of this question so the answer here is c the remaining terms pilaster is basically a false pillar a non-structural column used for ornamental purposes is generally called as pilaster gable is a type of sloping roof with slopes on two sides so these are the terms template as such it is a generalized term not something which is uh, an architectural uh, terminology aspect moving on to the next one seventh question ornamental work of branch like lines in the upper part of gothic window is called as tracery oriel cuspidation foliation all the four terms are used or relevant with the gothic architectural features or characteristics itself but the correct answer over here the branch like elements the first picture which i put over here you can see there are branch like elements 
in the ornamentation part so these branch like elements which you see in the ornamentation these are called as tracery so the correct answer would be option a what is tracery tracery is a decorative work in gothic architecture which is generally made out of stone all these carvings remember are generally made out of stone so stone decorative work with thin bars used to support the glass what is the structural purpose of it to support the glass not only for ornamentation purpose it also supports the glass so uh, slender bars of stone used in decorative branch work in gothic windows also supports the glass is called as tracery now what are the remaining three options let us get a sense of the incorrect options also oriel if you know is a type of bay window you can also call oriel as a type of bay window what is a bay window it basically is a window which projects out of a wall. So, Oriel is uh, a term related to bay window which is a window projecting out of a wall. Cuspidation you can see in these pictures in Gothic architecture you always see cuspidation. Now, cuspidation and foliation both are terms related to Gothic architecture but it is not branch like lines. Branch like lines is tracery. What is cuspidation then? The flower like elements in Gothic architecture is called as cuspidation. You might have heard about even in Mughal architecture you have cuspidach. C-U-S-P-E-D. Generally in Mughal architecture, depressed arch or a depressed pointed arch was used earlier. But during the reign of Shah Jaha, uh, cast arch started, uh, was started being used in buildings, uh, all the buildings including in Red Fort uh, and also in Taj Mahal. In various elements uh, under the reign of Shah Jaha, it is said, it is also called a Shah Jahani arch because of that reason. Reason cast arch. Cast arch is basically an arch which has cusps. This was promoted during the in the Mughal architecture during the reign of Shah Jahan, right? So you can remember why am I relating it to the other terms? The cusp term relates to those dentricles or the circular elements. Now the flower-like elements in Gothic architecture also are, is called as cuspidation. Why? Because these are cusps. So there are different types of uh, sorry. This the, this is called as foliation, right? So cusped is basically these points. So for, you can see the foil. Sink foil is five petals. So foilation is a term for flower like elements whereas cuspidation is what I explained over here the inner pointed edges the points which you see so these sharp edges which are being followed these are called as cusps so cusps are basically these pointed pointed elements so if you look into gothic architecture you'll have you'll find both you'll find cuspidation foliation also foliation is these flower like elements sink foil is five petal flower trefoil is a three petal flower Quarter foil is a four petal flower. So those flower elements are called as foliation. Uh, whereas cuspidation is where you have these pointed elements. You can care carefully observe in this picture. You can also look into other pictures on the internet. I'm sure you will find these cusps in Gothic architecture. You can see over here as well. So the point like element is called as cuspidation. Remember with the term cusp, cusp arch, which is also seen in Mughal architecture. So that's about this question of tracery. Remember the important terms, not only in Gothic architecture, in all the styles, in all the character, in all the uh, historic styles and the history of architecture, you should know the terminology and the elements used in that particular style. That's question number seven. Moving on to the next one, integrity of design concerns primarily with integrity, the term integrity, just you can uh, search on the internet or in any dictionary, just look for the meaning of what is integrity. Integrity is basically oneness. Integrity is basically cohesive looking, uh, uh, feeling as if it is a single element. So when you are designing a building, it should look like, a, for example, if you look into Taj Mahal, I am giving you the example of Taj Mahal because it is easy to uh, recall the picture of it, the aesthetics of it. It will, it doesn't seem as if the central chamber is a different building. The four minarets, it is altogether a different building. You would never feel it that way because it looks as if it is a cohesive single element because everything is on a common plinth. Everything has a unifying material that is white marble. Everything has a similar architectural design, uh, the, the design features of it, right? Because of which it has that integrity. Integrity is feeling as if it is a single building, oneness, a feeling that it is a single unit. So unity is the correct answer for that. Uh, integrity and unity are uh, synonyms you can say both relate to the same meaning so unity is the answer for this uh, so it is one of the basic principles of design uh, so unity is integrity moving on uh, what is unity or integrity it's feeling as if it is a single element or a single building or a single design next question arrangement of organs now let me also tell you one more point over here never think that in all 100% of the building designs or 100% of the architects follow the basic principles of design. 
not necessarily what are the principles of design you have balance symmetry so all these basic principles unity harmony uh, rhythm all these are various principles of design it's not necessary that each building follows one or all principles of design you also have buildings which do not follow any principle of design uh, uh, if anyone knows the answer you can comment it which style of architecture is against following the basic principles of design there's one particular style or a feature uh, it is it is under postmodernism basically a style within postmodern architecture which is against following the basic principles of design like symmetry harmony uh try to comment down the answer i will confirm if someone comments the answer in the chat moving on uh mean so I, in these live sessions there is a slight sla uh, lag between what i speak and what you answer uh so try to manage with it let's try to manage with that but yeah uh, kim sharma already has an answer deconstructivism is the correct answer deconstructivism is a style which is against following the basic principles of design of harmony and symmetry correct moving on to the next one ninth question arrangement of organs in human body exemplifies the design principle of the best human body is a best example for a lot of design principles including symmetry because you have that biaxial uh, symmetry bilateral symmetry uh, other than that you also have unity in the composition of human body you don't feel that a human body is not a single element so intrinsically we feel that okay human body is a complete composition a single unit one person is a single unit or full complete with complete unity in it right so that is uh, the most appropriate answer rhythm remember is wherever you see there is repetition rhythm is a term you can remember this way r and r Rep rhythm relates to repetition generally rhythm relates to repetition there is no uh, same element repeating not once or twice but multiple times that is not something which you see essentially in human body unity is the most appropriate you can say uh, in the given options moving on the next question now this is talking about repetition i just told you about repetition the repetition of windows in large buildings is to impress the viewer by now you need to so these questions where you have options like one only two only so it is like multiple select question mul selecting multiple options these can be tricky you have to look into the question very carefully should not take a decision right away at the go just by looking into repetition selecting okay rhythm is the answer you can you you can get negative marking in such approach try to cave even if you're confident take at least 10 to 15 seconds take some time and analyze the remaining options also let us look into this one the repetition of windows in large buildings is to impress the viewer by dash which of the following is or are correct is being asked so let us look into one by one the first one is harmony and balance uh, the second is movement and rhythm space and function obviously now rhythm is already a correct answer so two for sure is a correct option let us just try take out some time and look into the remaining if they are correct or not now repetition of windows in large buildings in large buildings you don't have one single window you repeat it multiple times now what is the motive in that uh, it is uh, obviously from functional aspect also you cannot have a large building with a single window that will not ensure sufficient amount of light for you in the uh design of it right so uh, functionality also is an option space now what is space in design positive and negative space if you look into this picture a large building with repetitive windows you can see that there is a background a white background and those windows on the top that is creating a foreground wherever you have a background and a foreground that's basically creating positive and negative space so space and function also is a relevant option now if you if two are if two are correct from the options just you can by elimination approach right away select d but let us also see what is harmony and balance uh, balance is basically where uh, harmony particular harmony and unity are the same thing three things unity harmony and integrity these are synonyms to each other harmony is basically where you feel that it is a cohesive single unit composition now in a large building due to repetition of same type of windows you will feel that oneness you will see that it is of you do you see a sense of unity in it so all the three options are correct d is the appropriate answer in this particular question so you need to have a good understanding on the basic principles of design as well from the upsc examination point of view moving on to the next one question number 11 Psychography refers to. Just give me a second. Hmm. So the next one, eleventh question. Psychography refers to dash. I'm hundred percent sure all of you are from architecture background, and you might have studied about psychography right away in your first year of your BR itself, right? 
Sciography relates to, you can see this picture where you have massing, so we have these assignments in architectural graphics generally, massing using 3D blocks, creating sciography by using light. So I'm sure I, uh, there is rarely anyone who doesn't know the answer for it. Sciography relates to the study of geometry of shadows, shadow projections. So like what is what should be the shadows shape based on the position of the sun. So that is sciography in architecture and in art. Next one. The purpose of entourage is to dash. Uh, so basically, uh, entourage in architecture, I hope you know the meaning of it when we design these buildings, when we provide particularly 3D renders. We don't only provide the render of a building. You provide some plants and trees. You, pro you provide, uh, if, you, if there's a road in front of it, you provide some vehicles over there. Even in walkthroughs, in 3D walkthroughs also, when you render 3D renders or 3D uh, walkthroughs as well. You provide people. If you do not provide people, just provide a building. It will not give you a sense of proportion and scale. So if you're having a building block, we have people, different type of people, kids. If you're designing a kindergarten, for example, you'll also place uh, small kids playing games over there, right? So that gives you a sense of scale and proportion. Entourage is basically in architecture using plants, people doing various activities, vehicles, animals, Providing these to give a sense of proportion and reality to the object or render that's called as entourage. So if you look into the options, what is the purpose of entourage? Encourage people to draw human figures, obviously no. Mot <clears throat> Motivate an artist to draw perfectly, obviously no. Uh, bring a sense of scale and increase the dimension of reality, that's the appropriate answer. De develop architects to do manual sketches is not a correct answer. So entourage relates to adding the sense of reality and proportion and scale to the architectural drawings. That's the answer. Moving on to the next one, 13th question. Which of the following color groups is an example of analogous colors? Now remember, analogous colors in a in a so there's something called as 12-part color wheel. You all should be very well and confident in the context of 12-part color wheel. In a 12-part color wheel, opposite colors are called as complementary colors because they complement each other. Analogous colors are any set of three continuous colors. So from the given options, you should find out which option is set of three continuous colors on a 12 part color wheel. You need not uh, have a idea or you need not have a color wheel in front of you to answer the question. You can quickly draw the color wheel whenever you want. The, pre the three primary colors of a color wheel, red, yellow and blue. So write the co primary colors first. Then th by mixing one, any two primaries, you'll get secondary color. By mixing, uh, say, red and blue, you'll get violet. That's a secondary color. By mixing uh, blue and yellow, you'll get green. By mixing yellow and red, you'll get orange. These are secondary colors. So you will write the secondary colors in between these. This is violet. The next level, by mixing one primary and one secondary, you will get a tertiary color. So always the name of a tertiary color, uh, it is by mixing one primary and a secondary. So the naming of it also will be always primary plus secondary. So you will write red orange, that is a second tertiary color or it is also called as intermediate color. Red violet is the next. You always write the name of the primary first and then the, right, the secondary uh, name after it. Uh, blue violet is the next intermediate color BV. Then here you have blue green, yellow green and here you have yellow orange right uh, so from these three which is a set of analogous colors you need to find out the option which is so this is the color wheel the 12 part color wheel the three primaries then three secondaries one primary plus secondary you will write it as a tertiary so this i did not write it draw it as a perfect circle but i hope you are able to visualize and understand the 12 part color wheel from the options, yellow, red and blue, that's not, that's forming a triangle, it's called as a triad or a set of primary colors, that's not the option. So if you see option D, that is following the rule which I told you, analogous colors is set of, set of three continuous colors, red, orange, red and red violet. So this is set of three continuous colors, that is the correct answer for analogous color scheme. Analogous color scheme is where you have three continuous colors. It is used to create a harmonious composition without something completely standing out. If you want to have a complete balance over the composition uh, and you do not want any color to protrude or stand out, that's where we use analogous color scheme in art or in interior design and architecture as well. So that's the answer for the 13th question. Next one, 14th one, who contributed to the still uh, art movement? 
and uh, also evoked the non-representational form called neoplasticism consisting of white background with a grid of black lines and three primary colors. So this is a type of artwork where uh, this particular uh, concept of distill this became popular in Netherlands. It, is, it was promoted by Dutch artists and architects. The, uh, the first person who gave this theory or who proposed the neoplasticism style with the simplicity of white background. So the explanation, the concept of distill style, uh, style as a white background with black grid over it and the composition filling it with primary colors uh, that is red, yellow and blue. This particular approach was first given by Theo van Dosberg. So that's the answer for this question. From the remaining options, Pablo Picasso has nothing to do with this distill style because uh, distill style is a much later style, 19th century style of Netherlands. It's a Dutch art. It was given by the Dutch artist Theo van Dosberg. The remaining two, Gerrit Ritveld and Piet Mondrian, these people are associated with the style. Uh, but the first person who proposed this particular style was Theo van Dosberg, who gave this approach of white background, black lines and primary colors, using it in art. art. This was given by Theon van Dusburg. Pete Mondrian is also an artist who followed the same principles of using primary colors. Garrett Ritveld, on the other hand, he was a furniture, a product designer and an architect who used, uh, uh, so he also designed buildings using this D style style, uh, D still style in architecture as well. Garrett Ritveld, Ritveld is an important architect. The remaining two are artists. So answer is option A for this particular question. You need to know various styles, important proponents, architects and artists related to that particular style. So uh, we are studying, solving the question. This is a question solving session, but in your self study, you should also focus now. We have eliminated one artist, Pablo Picasso. So you should take time and look into the features or the styles given by Pablo Picasso, like Pontillism was given by him. So all these different styles promoted by uh, the artist Pablo Picasso, you need to do some research on it uh, in your self study. Moving on to the next one, 15th question. The term morphing refers to dash, dramatic transition, enlargement, integration, sudden translation. So morphing is basically, uh, you might have heard about morphed, morphed picture. Morphing is nothing but changing that to a dramatic change, not a small change. Small change is called as an improvement probably, right? It is a dramatic transition. Dramatic transition is a huge drastic change. Like for example, you have a raccoon over here. It has been morphized, you might have studied metamorphis metamorphism or biomorphism, biomorphology in frogs, right? So you have a tadpole which changes into a frog, which altogether the tail just goes away and it becomes a frog. That's called as morphology or morphosis, right? Morph relates to change in the form, which is a dramatic transition. So that's the answer for the question of morphism. Morphism is used as a uh, technique to evolve abstract shapes. You can use natural elements and create abstract. Like for example, I gave you that example of uh, uh, Zaha Hadid's building, uh, the Haider Ali uh, Center in Baku uh, in Azerbaijan. That particular building, it is said to have inspired from free flowing waves. So waves are a natural element. Your, uh, so Zaha Hadid had morphized, used morphism to change it into the form, a, sing, uh, a, a folded form of the building, right? So that is morphing. Morphing is a dramatic transition of a natural, generally architects use it to change a natural element into a usable element or a building as such. That's morphism. Next one, the term ghosting in the context is used in the context of dash. So ghosting is a technique which is used by architects and also, also artists to hide the lines. If you draw, you might have all done this exercise of drawing 1 point, 2 point and 3 point perspective. You use those construction lines, you use a vanish point, you use those lines. But towards the end, once the complete sketch is done, will you see those lines? Obviously no, all those are hidden lines. So that's called as ghosting of lines. Ghosting is a term used in art and architectural graphics where you hide the lines which are used to just give you give the artist a sense of space and sense of shape so invisible line is the answer for this question invisible line uh, using invisible lines just to give a sense of understanding in the process of sketching that's called as ghosting so d is the correct answer for that question number 16 next one Question number 17. Uh, now, uh, let me also tell you one thing here. The idea of solving these questions is not because you will again get these questions in the exam. The idea is to give you a sense of learning concepts related to now you can you may not get a similar question or you may not get the same question again but you might get a question remotely related to it so understanding building your knowledge base 
you should do your self study subject by subject studying is uh, taking all the list of uh, history of architecture study it completely urban planning study it completely so subject wise study is important along with that when you practice questions you will build you will expand the horizons of your knowledge base and that's very important for competitive exams question number 17 the minimum time delay required between initiation of successive memory operations is called as this is related to computer applications it has nothing to do with architecture this particular con the, the given definition is memory cycle so in ram what is RAM in a computer? It is basically where the running operations, the memory used for operations which are still running. So a RAM, uh, you might have you might have heard there are different types of RAM, right? Uh, uh, so RAM basically uh, the process, the capacity of it uh, to the time basically it takes between two successive operations. You ask it to do something, that's first operation. You again ask it to do a second thing. There will be some time gap between it based on the capacity of the RAM. So that's basically called as memory cycle time, the time gap between two successive operations. You give a command and when is it ready to take the second command? That gap is called as memory cycle time. So that's the option for this. It's related to computer applications as I told you, has nothing to do with architecture. This question also is from the same area of that from the same subject. 18th question, when the available RAM is not sufficient for the system to run the current application. So when the RAM is not sufficient for the application to run, it will take some memory of the hard disk from the hard disk this later memory is called so an additional memory used by the computer in the place so this depends on the operating system windows operating system which most of us use that also is designed in such a way whenever the ram capacity is not sufficient some space of the hard disk can be utilized for the purpose of ram so what is it called as virtual memory auxiliary memory buffer memory cache memory cache memory you can right away uh, eliminate it you know what is cache it is basically where the uh, so if you are looking into something just like in the browsers you have cookies right you are opening a browser it will save some information so that when you come again to the same browser it will be easy to reload the page same thing in a computer cache memory is where if you are doing the same action multiple times it will start being shown in the recent recent works or in the recent documents so that's basically where the cache if you delete the cache memory all those recent uh, items will be removed so this is not what they are asking it's not additional space utilized by ram buffer memory buffer memory is a transitional memory for example if you are having a computer you give a command to take print out of something from the from your printer so in the process of giving the command the data transfer from the system to an external unit could be printer could be a keyboard or a mouse whatever external unit is it that's uh, the transitional memory is called as buffer memory so that's also not an extension of ram auxiliary memory is altogether a different thing auxiliary memory is an external hard disk or an external pen drive or a uh, so generally we use those pen drives right that's auxiliary extra memory virtual memory is the answer for the given question virtual memory is basically the extra space uh, when the ram capacity is already at full to use an additional memory if the hard disk memory is being used that's called as uh, virtual memory that's the answer for the 18th one next 19th question uh, the narrow streets with tall buildings are characteristics of vernacular layouts of which of the following cities or uh, which of the following climates basically they are talking about climate responsive design here. The question is narrow streets with tall buildings are uh, characteristic of which particular climate they are asking narrow streets and tall buildings that will help in creating shading, shaded spaces. So the sunlight will not reach till the broad bottom, right? So when you're having narrow street and tall buildings, you will have shaded space created. Shaded streets is an important aspect in hot climates. So from the given option, hot and humid, temperate, coastal uh, climate city, cool climate, hot and arid climate. So generally in hot and humid, it is important to shade, but it is equally important to create ventilation also. In hot and humid, ventilation plus shading, both are important. But this aspect, it is nothing promoting ventilation as such. So this particular characteristic is generally seen in the vernacular cities with hot and arid climate. So you have compactness in hot and so arid is basically dry climate. In hot and dry climate, shading is of paramount importance. So to create shading, generally compactness, clustered layouts, compact plans, compact or clustered layouts are generally seen. In humid climate, because ventilation is important, you have more of openness. You have large openness with row housing and all. So you don't have compact clusters as such. So the option, uh, correct option for this question will be option C, where narrow streets are used hot and dry climate. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नंबर ट्वेंटी विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कैन बी यूज टू हीट एंड कूल द एयर इन अ बिल्डिंग सो इन अ स्पेस इन सिंपल टर्म्स हीटिंग एंड कूलिंग एलिमेंट रिलेट टू द एच वी एसी सिस्टम द क्वेश्चन हियर इज from the given options which has to do which is which are terms related to hvac system if you know the basics of hvac system you can without any delay you can select the ducts ducts and clean them so air flow windows that is used for ventilation not for heating and cooling as such uh, solar apertures these are used for heat gain as such but not for cooling daylight apertures used for lighting of spaces so the correct answer which are used to carry cool and dry uh, cool and uh, hot air that is basically ducts and plenums you know already what duct work is Duct works are basically those aluminum channels which are generally concealed in the fall ceiling, which carry the air from the air handling unit. Plenums, on the other hand, these are pressurized chambers which supply the air. Generally, you have supply plenums and uh, retake in inlet plenum, plenums also supply and return plenums are used in the fall ceiling to supply and return the air. So, plenum is basically a connection. So, it is something between the if this is the air handling unit, <coughs> you have duct carrying and supplying the air. at the supply point you have a plenum so plenum duct work and the air handling unit these are the elements which are interconnected in a hvac system so c is the correct answer for this question next one the term comfort zone is used in relation to which of the following so you need to know the uh, charts basically uh, sun dial is used for sun path analysis uh, sun sun path diagram same thing has to do with sun diagram sun path diagrams uh this will basically give you the position of sun at a given given latitude on a given time at a given day so you to understand the position of sun we use this so what is a uh, comfort zone determined in if you know the concept of bioclimatic chart that represents a comfort zone so bioclimatic chart is basically a graph which is plot between relative humidity on the x axis and it has the dry bulb temperature on the y axis this plot gives you an area which is called as comfort zone so this is basically intersection what are the relative humidity values overlapped with which range of dry bulb temperature is comfort zone is determined as comfort zone that is plotted on this graph this is called as bioclimatic chart this chart was developed by a hungarian architect by name viktor olge Victor Olgei was a Hungarian architect who gave bioclimatic chart defining what the comfort zone should be for human beings where he defined the relative humidity values and the dry bulb temperature value range where the comfort zone can fit into so comfort zone is shown in a bioclimatic chart questions can not only be asked like this questions can be asked what are the what is what are the terms in bioclimatic this was asked in a competitive exam earlier bioclimatic chart is a plot between dash and dash it's a plot between dry bulb temperature and relative humidity what is it used for it is used to analyze the comfort zone and the thermal comfort who gave it victor olge so you need to remember these basic things in each and every uh, concept or in each and every question this should be your approach to study next one uh, i s h r a e stands for so this basically uh, is an organization uh, it is an institute basically uh, which was which is held which which is uh, developed from the concept of a s h r a e ashri ashri is american society for heating refrigeration and air conditioning engineers as an extension to it even in india i s h r a e started hi s h r a e is indian society of heating refrigeration and air conditioning engineers so that's the correct answer this particular institute or organization they give uh, they they basically are involved in training and certification of the people and students professionals and also students in the area of heating refrigeration and air conditioning so answer is d for this it's an acronym based question next one question number 23 a building that uses technology programming and remote control per, for better efficiency is green building obviously no green building has to do with uh, using eco friendly material uh, doing life cycle analysis of construction material and techniques that's what green building is sustainable building also the same thing life cycle analysis of building material and construction approach that's the focus of sustainable architecture so a and d is not the option over here we are talking about technology technology like internet of things iot automatic automatic uh, so if, if there's darkness automatically the light should switch on uh, so that's basically a concept called as intelligent or smart building so there are two things here so from the given options smart building is the answer but there is one more related term intelligent building systems
so if this would have been the option also along with uh, the given options instead of eco friendly if they are giving intelligent building then which will be the answer even in that case smart building b will be the answer so you need to know what is the basic difference between uh, what is the basic difference between a smart building and a intelligent building system so the basic difference is smart building also has the capability of remote control you can sit in your office and switch on the television or switch on the air conditioner for example you're traveling from your office to home it is peak summer by the time you reach home you want your room to be very cold so you can open your mobile using internet of things iot concept you can switch on the air conditioner by the time you reach your home it will be cool so that is seen only in smart building you don't have that feature in intelligent building system intelligent building systems are designed to work on themselves without it you cannot give it and give an input to it it will if there is darkness it will switch on the light if it is hot it will switch on the air conditioner you it cannot take inputs from you so that's the basic thin line of difference between intelligent buildings and smart buildings however both terms are used interchangeably generally smart building is the relevant answer for this particular question let's now look into the next one uh, ceilometer is used for measuring cloud ceiling visibility during fog fog density ceilometer al along with uh, uh, so this is something which is generally used in airport terminals you have anemometer also to measure the wind velocity ceilometer is also an important setup or equipment used in airports it basically measures the thickness of the cloud height of the cloud it measures these basic uh, parameters so ceilometer is an instrument which measures using laser equipment lidar technology it basically sends laser equipment and measures what time is it taking to bounce back and what are the proper or what what is the intensity which is with which it is coming back based on that it basically measures the clouds what is cloud ceiling the height height from the ground level to the base of the cloud this is called as cloud ceiling so answer is one one only will be the correct answer ceilometer is an instrument used to measure the height from the base that's ground level to the cloud base to the base of the cloud and also the thickness of the cloud is also given as an outcome so these are the uh, parameters measured using a ceilometer next one question number 25 uh, i think the schedule time is almost done but let us take five more minutes because i had a target to do till 30th question let's do the first 30 questions in this part one so let us do the remaining five questions also five more minutes and then we'll end the session large windows window openings and jali are a common feature of traditional buildings in dash i already told you traditional buildings with ventilation as a so large windows large openings jali all these have to do with ventilation and ventilation is important aspect in which type of climate hot and dry no hot and humid absolutely that will be the correct answer so wherever there is humidity ventilation becomes important why because if it is humid climate people start to sweat to create comfort you need proper ventilation and airflow so airflow is an important ventilation is an important factor in the hot and humid climate b is the answer for this question next one while designing climate responsive you see there are a lot of questions from climate responsive design also in this 2016 question paper while designing climate responsive building insulation properties of material play an important role which of the following pertains to this consideration which has to do with which parameter which factor or which value has to do with insulation they are asking so r value is called as insulation value r is generally called as resistance thermal resistance what is thermal resistance of a building material it is the ability to resist heat which is nothing but insulation also so it measures the insulation properties of building materials for example if you're designing something in hot and dry climate you need to use building components which have good uh, insulation which have good insulation capacities in other words you can say which have good resistance values r value should be high so that they can resist the heat from coming into the building so r value has to do with insulation and resistance or so thermal resistance the reciprocal of r value is called as u factor so u factor also is pertaining to the same concept most appropriate answer would be a however in a revised answer key a and also b was also given marks b also is correct because u factor is nothing but the reciprocal of r value in building components i'm not going into the details of the formula measurement and all uh, but i would suggest you to i will strongly recommend you to read the definitions look into the measurement units you also get questions on the measurement units of it like uh, u value is measured in watt per meter square degree centigrade r value is measured in meter square degree centigrade per watt right so remembering the measurement units the definition of these terms that's very important for competitive exams point of view so r value is the most appropriate answer 
u value also was given marks later on so uh, that's how it was in the 2016 answer key so next one a multi storied central space within a building covered on the top this is key covered on the top is important because light well also is a multi storied central open space but light well will not be open it will it will be open on the top not covered light well will be open on the top because it should it should allow light to enter into the spaces due to reflections right light well is a multi storied open well which is open on the top they are talking covered on the top so covered on the top answer will be atrium plaza is an open space public space basically public square is called as a plaza courtyard you know it is a central space not necessarily multi storied if you are having a multi storied space which is covered on the top that is atrium so c is the answer for this question uh, next one the repeated sequence of two shapes changing in changing order of appearance in a directional pattern is called so if there are is there's a repeated sequence of two shapes if there are two different shapes something like say if say there is a star and a circle it is repeating but not the same shape alternating so from the given options alternation is the correct answer so this is called as alternation the same thing repeating but repeating in the order of two different shapes gradation is basically repetition with a gradual increase if i draw something like this it is repetition but with a gradual increase this is called as gradation harmony i told you harmony and unity are one and the same balance also you know balance is basically you have symmetrical balance asymmetrical balance so these are basically types of rhythm you have uh, gradation rhythm you have alternation rhythm these are types of rhythm uh, types of repetition so alternation is the answer d is the correct answer from the given options next one which of the following classical order provides a column shaft height of 7 times the base diameter now this is this relates to the slenderness of the classical order columns you have to remember this doric column the height of a doric column is equal to generally it is 4 to 7 times the base diameter height of a ionic order column as per sir benista fletcher's book it is 9 times the base diameter sir benister fletcher's comp compilation of history of architecture recognizes height of a ionic order as 9 times of base diameter and height of a corinthian order column is defined as 10 times the base diameter generally now i am quoting the book which i am referring to sir benister fletcher's book but there are some other books of history of architecture which refer height of an ionic order column as generally around 8 times the base diameter also so it is 8 or 9 times the base diameter but you can refer to Uh, similarly height of a corinthian order also is generally defined as 9 or 10 times the base diameter so it is different different sources but generally most accepted value is 9 and 10 for the height of ionic and corinthian whereas height of a tuscan order column it is defined as 7 times the base diameter so from the given options tuscan would be the most appropriate answer however marks were given for those who selected doric also because doric order also can go up to 7 times the base diameter so both a and b are the correct answers however a is the most appropriate answer so that's about uh, this particular question number 29 last question which one of the following staircase of same width would occupy the minimum area if you are considering these four staircase elliptical staircase of a given width it will be something like this this is a given width let us say x dog leg staircase you know what a dog leg staircase is something which moves in this direction let us say this is x that's the area occupied by it a uh, spiral staircase this is say let us say area diameter x that's talking about the equal width if you consider the staircase quarter turn staircase it will have a turn like this so if you consider a staircase of this particular width this area will be the area occupied by it so which has the minimum area obviously circle is a shape which has minimum area for a given diameter so spiral would be the correct answer for this question remaining will occupy larger area for a given width of staircase let me write it in another color so spiral is the answer if you considering a given width of staircase and create a spiral staircase in terms of plan that will have the minimum area requirement that's the reason wherever there is constraint of area you generally provide spiral staircases if for example there's a uh, there's a building along the main road uh you want people to move upwards if you don't have enough area you can provide a spiral staircase that will occupy less area
right so that's about the first 30 questions of this 2016 question paper i hope you understood the concepts which we discussed and i hope it was useful for your preparation any further doubts you can always put it in the into the chat and we will try to respond to most of the chats uh, most of the messages we have received over there at our best possible capacity we will meet in the next session you will get an update stay st subscribe to this youtube channel you can enroll for a detailed study subject wise study if you want help from us you can enroll into our batches our classes are already live we have cpwd preparation classes already going on you can enroll into that particular batch for your preparation the same faculty who are teaching on the youtube channel will also be teaching you over there enroll into our classes also do subscribe to the channel for regular updates you will have a next part two session very soon uh, so we will complete this particular 2016 paper in four parts as i told you part one part two part three and part four 30 questions each part uh, so approximately an hour of session Thank you for attending the session and we'll meet you in the next live session of part 2 for 2016 CPWD paper and uh, take care meanwhile. Bye everyone.